and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we have Alejandro Rojas coming up with the news in just a minute. Um, I want to thank everyone that supports the show. And for just $2 or more a month, you can help us out. And all that information is on podcastufo.com. And if you can't do that and you still want to listen to the full, full shows, you can watch it on YouTube every uh, Wednesday or on podcastufo.com every Wednesday at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or on the Dark Matter Network. And that's at uh, that's at 10 to midnight p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And again, thanks everyone that helps us out. Our guest this evening is Linda Zimmerman. Linda's been on a number of times. Uh, she's going to be talking first. We're going to be talking about the Pentagon UFO and what that has changed in her life as far as that story coming out. And then we're going to be talking about ghosts and hauntings and all of her investigations Um uh, as I had mentioned before a number of times, once in a while I'm going to put in a different type of show, and that is tonight, and I'm really excited about having Linda on. She's always, always great. And that's it for me. Alejandro, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, Hello. good. Hello. Hello, YouTube. Yeah, that's right. Oh, by the way, uh, Evan is our uh, show producer, and I think things are going to be going a lot smoother now. Um, it just seems like... Uh, it's so much nicer to have some help. I really uh, feel I can't believe also. you tackled all of that, doing all the technical switching and everything. And I know the program you use. It, I was I've been playing with it to use myself oh, to yes. speak about stuff and and to try to see uh, and and share insight all at the same time. I don't know how you did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. The one thing I can never stop is when internet goes out and occasionally that happens. Just can't stop that, you know. Uh, Robert Powell and mine went out at the same time. <laughs> that was just really crazy. And, of course, it was the government. We know it's the government that did that. Who else, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we anyway, better be careful. I know. Better watch my P's and Q's. So what's going on in the UFO world? Well, UFO stuff, There's there is some news out there. Um, I don't know. I don't think anything really huge i mean there's there's of course the uk tabloids are always making a big deal about some really wild and and sometimes goofball kind of stuff so there's always something in those silly uk tabloids and it kills me because of course sometimes they interview some of us uh, and they have some decent stuff but i feel that that is far and few between so and i always acknowledge it because i know people are seeing it because now they're doing stories every day um, sometimes stealing stories like they stole uh, the son story about an interview with me and it just blatantly one of the other ones just takes it summarizes and doesn't give credit so there's that out there uh, again wow. take that with a grain of salt I guess is all I'm warning people but otherwise what's cool is mainstream media I think is taking note of this topic much more so for instance Brooklyn talking about being out there near New York not too far from where Linda is at right now a lot closer than i am that's for sure and closer than you are uh brooklyn yeah. uh there's a story in their paper about ufo sightings out there so that's pretty cool um also a, an article about ufos skyrocketing uh in at least the the number of sightings skyrocketing in italy so that's kind of interesting oh, and wow. that's made from uh some news that's that's gone on out there and uh this is kind of cool too and the T.C. Palm, it's a Florida local paper. 
There's a guy, you know, some businessman in the area who decided he wanted to write about how UFOs need to be taken more seriously. And and this DOD thing kind of uh, shows that. So really interesting. Uh, Newsweek has an article. They're kind of debunking some of the stuff people see on Mars. But, uh, you know, I, I, I kind that's of... That's okay. I, yeah, that's okay, because there is some silly stuff regarding that. But still, I think there's a lot more, and you and, and Linda, I know, are going to talk about there, a lot more, uh, I think, coverage and mainstream coverage of this topic, and serious coverage um, right. than there were previous. I think, you know, if, if a local guy decides to write an opinion piece on how we need to pay attention to UFOs, I think prior to um, December, people even would have scoffed more than they are now. Now, you know, uh, I think people like him feel more. Im- hey, hey, you know, I believed in the, I've believed in this stuff for years and I'm tired of hiding it. And now I'm going to tell everybody that I, I agree. This is a significant uh, mystery out there. Right. Well, let's talk about you had a great interview. I listened to it today um, with Leslie Kane. Just fantastic. And uh, so I, th- I think I'm actually going to put a link to that in the show notes here. OK, so uh, but. Um, I just thought it was just so well done and a lot of stuff came out. I mean, I was so interested in some of the things she said. You know, we've all been dying to ask questions about the the background and what happened, how and why, what does she know about the program and this and that. And we're all looking for those answers. So, so luckily, hopefully, uh, a week from today, I'll be interviewing Louise and ask Elizondo, of course, the guy who ran the program. So we'll get a lot more answers then. But we still got some great answers. Uh, like for me, what was really interesting is how the story came about to be in the first place. And, you know, with all of these conspiracy theories that run rampant and people assuming, well, it's obvious how this came about. The smoking man, you know, showed up in the garage and and told her to do this. And that discounts the work that people do. So what really Mm -hmm. happened, you know, is that she, uh, you know, you've interviewed her and I did after October when uh, the two the stars announced that they started their organization and she identified this is really important. So she went to a colleague who writes for the New York Times who's friendly uh, on this topic, Ralph Blumenthal, and he said, you're right, this is a big deal, let's do this. So he, he um, you know, championed it. They went to the New York Times and the, they talked the New York Times into it and essentially the New York Times says, we'll do it. Um, But, you know, we got to do it the right way. And so they did a lot of hard work, a lot of research. They did interviews with important people, with Louise, of course. And then they released their article, which was well-researched. And and that obviously had a huge impact. And I think that's really important that people understand how this works. Because when people just, you know, throw out, oh, it's obvious that the, the media is under control and they only do what people tell them to do. I work in the media um lee works lee spiegel who of course we work with a lot works in the media i think Lin, well linda works uh, in the media um leslie of course does and george knapp and bryce zabel who's going to be speaking at the conference and so many people we can go on and on that's what they do you know and and you can ask those people how it actually works and all of these people come up with their own stories they're not told what stories to come up with um, what's difficult is people are like, well, why don't they print this or that? Well, there's a high bar when it comes to credibility and you've got to reach that bar. You've got to have credible sources for your information and it'll be taken yeah. seriously. And unfortunately people, when you throw out speculation and, and, you know, uh, all of these things, you have to substantiate what you say. And Leslie does that. And that's why her stories do very, very well, and um, you know, and they're they're all so important for raising the credibility for this field in general. So, yeah, yep. it was great to hear the details about how that all came about. Yeah, and one of the things that I really liked, you know, I thought was very interesting, is she said it was so much work. She yeah. said every single paragraph, we had to have, you know, the backup. We had to have. You know, I mean, they had to edit, they had to, you know, the New York Times wanted to make sure everything was just perfect before that was, you know, released. Yeah, Which is- that was a great point because she says, you know, I can post what I want in the Huffington Post. Nobody says anything. And and that's the same for me. Uh, of course, if someone complains or they find out that we've been accurate, inaccurate or we're 
being goofy, then we'll get yanked and we'll never be able to do it again. Um, so we have to be careful in that way. But it's different when you're working with some of these other outlets like the New York Times, where they they have to fact check every single line. So it's a lot of work. They've got to substantiate every single thing that they're saying. And it's especially important in these days. People don't realize that. They, they talk about fake news and all of this other th- stuff, but they don't realize the hard work that is going on in the background to verify some of this. Because remember, the the media, their critics are not just the public or whoever they're writing about, be it politicians on either set or whatever, but each other. They check each other. It's a, it's a oh, cutthroat sure. field where, you know. Absolutely. If, New York Times screws something up, then that's going to be a news story, and and people will be going to be all over them. That's so, right. Mm-hmm. It's just like yeah. I check out your podcast to make sure you yeah. don't make any mistakes. To call me out. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, that alien that you had on there was not from Zeta Reticuli. That one's from <laughs> Venus. That's right. This, <laughs> yeah, you can't you tell for God's sake. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, uh, another thing that um, you know she makes a really good point on is that. There's no scent of any type of government manipulation or cover up in this thing, which I think yeah. is really important because there's so much out there. People are saying so many things along those lines. I thought what was really interesting is when I asked her if they ran the story by the DOD at all, she was taken aback. She's like, no, you know, and I know I've, you know, I've known Leslie for an, a long time and I can tell she was like, what a ridiculous question. She didn't yeah. like that question. But um, and I think she thought I, I was being kind of goofy. But in my defense, you know, Nick Pope said he did run his book by uh, the Ministry of Defense, his last Rendlesham. Um, and Charles Halt has ran his his stuff by because they're just trying to be careful. They they are still under their oaths. They're still patriots. They don't want to step over over boundaries or say anything that they shouldn't. So I don't think it would have necessarily. And in speaking with Louise, he's very careful with that, too. He doesn't want to compromise, you know, any information and he doesn't want to share anything he shouldn't either. And that's where I thought maybe he wanted to be careful and have his colleagues look at uh, the story before it was released. But it sounds like they didn't do that. However, in speaking with Louise, I know that he is careful about that and he does. uh, But at the same time, you know, uh, so we needed to know what level of government involvement there was. And it sounds like there was zero, except for the quotes that they got from uh, the DOD and, of course, Louise's uh, uh, cooperation. But he's now no longer with the government. So, um, yeah, there's some insight for people. Uh, a further indication that there was no manipulation or, or even influence on the story, uh, which I think you can tell from reading it because it's much more – transparent there's more information that we got from that story we know than we normally would from a government story or or agency um but louise you know people haven't heard from him much yet either on a lot of these topics and and so i can see maybe why they may be a bit skeptical uh, there as well and i'm lucky as where i've had a little bit more conversations and Fortunately, we're going to be sharing a lot more with people, and I know he's going to be coming out more, and people are going to get to know him better, and I think that will alleviate uh, a lot of people's concerns. A lot of people who want to think of him as some evil, you know, or manipulator who's who's only releasing information in a manner which he's instructed to do so, those people, some of them, I think, will also be disappointed because, unfortunately, that perspective of theirs, I think, will begin to crumble as they meet him. Some people right. are steadfast to that, but some people aren't. Some people are good people, and, and I, um, I've i even seen this where people are making these sorts of accusations, and he says, hey, I've seen some interactions where he said, no, this is what I'm really about. This is why I've done it. And then people are like, okay, you know, I can understand that. And it's all about just going out there, asking questions, and understanding that – the 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 machinations behind what motivates people and everything uh, before you make you know assumptions and steadfast you know uh, opinions uh, you got to go discover and get the information and that's fun I mean researching yeah. investigating is fun so you know uh, I think Linda is a perfect example your guest tonight she goes out there and does some research she wrote a story about dogs um, and, and UFO encounters uh, for oh, us yeah. not too long ago yeah. so fascinating you know it 
bringing to light a lot of information that people don't have and doing that research is fun and, 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 um, and getting the truth out there. It, the truth is also often stranger than fiction. And, uh, and so, you know, it's fun to get the real answers instead of just making assumptions. I don't, that's not as fun to me. (laughs) So just a couple of things. First of all, um, your interview with, uh, Louis Elizondo, is that going to be, uh, one that you're doing for the conference or is that going to be a podcast? No, that's for the conference. Uh, Maybe and that's hopefully in the f- yeah, yeah, that's yeah. you know in a in a month. So right. we'll probably put like bits and pieces of that out. But of course, uh, at, as normal with the lectures, you know, you can go online and watch them on video on demand. Uh, you can see Linda's presentations at the UFO Congress at uh, Video On Demand, or or you can purchase the DVDs at the store. We'll have pieces of it out, and we'll certainly write stories about some of the more important things that he says. But I think over time, uh, yeah, we'll hear him on podcasts and, and everything. I think uh, yeah. they're just being careful about this initial release of information with the New York Times. But uh, as time goes on and he begins to interact with people in the field more uh We'll all hear more from him. Yeah, I had Ralph Blumenthal on way back uh, a couple of years ago, and he actually, yeah. we've been in communication. Hopefully, he's going to come on within a few months, but he said he has some more reporting to do. But real cool. quickly, about your uh, about your conference, the International UFO Congress coming up in February, it starts February 14th or 15th? 14th. So it starts on Valentine's Day. Now, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be broadcasting just to let anyone know if you're listening and you're going to be there. I hope you uh, join us and uh, look me up. I'd love to meet anyone that's uh, that listens to the show there. Um, that, so that's going to be on Valentine's Day, and it's going to be at 6 p.m. local time, uh, Phoenix time, 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be doing your, that show. Your, the your show is? Oh, yeah. well, you've got to ask for a break or the time off because you're an employee for the conference. So <laughs> that's put right. in your request uh, and we'll I have see to put if that we can in writing, that don't in. I? Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll get that. Uh, I'll get that certified this week. All right. All right, Alejandro. Thanks so much. And yeah, uh, thank you. All right. We'll be talking to you next week. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Okay. So our guest is uh, we have Linda Zimmerman. Now she is a former research scientist. And uh, she began paranormal investigations over 20 years ago, and she is now an award-winning author. She has over 30 books. I couldn't believe I was looking through her books the other day. And um, a lot of them are on haunts, and we're going to be talking about her ghost investigations. And uh, she's also been on uh, TV a few times. We're going to be talking, uh, at first, we're going to talk about uh, UFOs, and then we'll get into the other stuff. Linda. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Yes, you're always a great guest. I'm always, always enjoy having you on. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, right off the bat, I would like to talk about what uh, has happened since uh, we were talking briefly ahead of time. What's happened in your world since the uh, story broke on uh, December 16th in the New York Times? Well, it was amazing. I immediately was getting calls and and emails and Facebook messages, you know, did you know that pilots were seeing things that they couldn't explain? And, um, you know, at first I'm like, well, what are we talking, the 40s, the 50s, you know, (laughs) which decade? Because to us, this is not new news. Um, But so many people, they finally listened. They finally heard what was being said. And it really affected them. And people who didn't have really any previous interest, suddenly they wanted to know. Um, And I've been getting, uh, I've had a big uptick in people sending me their uh, UFO stories from anywhere from last year to the 1970s. It's just, it's kind of opened the floodgates. And this is just... It's a wonderful time to be a re- UFO researcher. Absolutely. And uh, so where do you think, uh, I mean, it's interesting how, um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but people that have not really paid attention to UFOs are actually talking about them. Exactly. Um, I got an email from one friend who, you know, kind of would jokingly scoff at my interest in UFOs and suddenly he's you have to pay attention to this 
<laughs> and I said, yes, that's that's what I've been doing. Um, you know, it's like a, a whole generation of people have discovered UFOs. And it's it's really opened a lot of eyes and... And I hope the information keeps coming out because we can't, you know, the attention span of the average person is, you know, about five seconds. That's right. So we yeah. really need to keep up. Um, everybody keep doing what they're doing and getting more and more information out there. I agree 100%. And another thing is uh, we have to make sure the people that are looking for information get the right information. And exactly. It's very unfortunate that there's so much uh, bogus information out there that is going to quickly turn someone away. You know, I mean, once they get involved in something and find out it's a hoax or something like that, there's really no, we have no control over it. But all we can do is, you know, keep our side of the street clean, so to speak, and um, do what we can do. Right, right. You know, I... I avoid the politics, I avoid, um, you know, the controversies, my goal, get the information, do the research, interview the people, and then spread the stories. Um, get that information out in a, you know, in just a clean, unbiased way. Here's the information. Let the people decide what to do with it. Don't embellish it. You don't need to embellish a UFO story. I mean, that's right. Right? Um, they're, they're they're crazy enough. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Someone just emailed me yesterday. He said, "I I know you're going to think I sound as nutty as a Snickers bar, <laughs> but he had his story to tell from again 1983, decades and decades ago. But yeah. now he felt was the time to come out and tell someone." I'm so actually getting email as well um, from a number of people that are, you know, possibly the first time they've ever talked about it. I don't really know. But uh, yeah, it's 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 good times. I'm I'm really glad that I've stuck to this long enough to see this right. <laughs> this happen. And um and I think it's you know if it can be like you just said the attention span everything's so ephemeral it could just go so quickly and um and uh, with everything in the news now especially politics. People are just like, wow, that's really something. And then next week, you know, they forget all about it. Next day's news cycle and it's all yeah. all forgotten. But yeah. there's a lot of points still in this uh, story that I would like to see people really delve into. Like what caught my attention. I, I grew up during the, the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo you know, missions. Oh, yeah. I was I was yep. a space baby, and I love astronauts. I have a wall of astronaut photos. And when I heard that John Glenn was the one urging Harry Reid to look into this, that really caught my attention because Glenn was didn't really dip his toe into that subject um, during his career. He was, you know, he stood, you know, he stood back. And um, to know that he had seen something or know people who had, I would love to know more of what, what he knew. Um, and actually, I was reminded, I don't know if you ever used to watch the show Frasier. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. In 2001, John Glenn was on Frasier and they had, it was kind of presented as a little spoof where he just started talking about all these UFO sightings and how he hated to cover up the truth. And, you know, they were telling him, you can't say what you saw, you know, and he felt bad about that. And, you know, they presented it as a, you know, as a comedy. But in retrospect, maybe huh. he was telling the truth, you know. How uh, about that? I I, rem I don't remember him on there. I didn't happen to see that particular one. But... He was definitely a hero of mine when I was a, a, a child. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when someone of the caliber of John Glenn, I don't, I don't know how the younger generations feel about astronauts, but they were our heroes. They were. I mean, yeah. um, they just did the most amazing things. And to me, there is no better caliber of person um, to observe a UFO than, than an astronaut uh, or, you know, a test pilot or something like that. So 
I don't know if it's possible to find out more about what he knew or, you know, um, but I'm hoping to see more of that aspect of the story. Yeah. So that makes, uh, that's about four astronauts, maybe even five. You know, I know <clears throat> um, the fourth man on the moon, I got to interview Alan Bean uh, about his artwork on another show that I do. Um, but when I asked him if you talk about the major UFO sighting he had, um, you know, that's well documented, um, he wouldn't talk about it. So I don't know how many astronauts actually talk about it. There aren't too many. Um, I actually give a lecture on astronaut UFO sightings, um, oh, wow. which is something I started years ago, um, and a lot more has come out. But um, I don't know what kind of agreements they signed, but I think it does a disservice to science to not talk about it, because these are the people we can trust, and if they have a legitimate sighting, People should know about it. So maybe, maybe this whole Pentagon UFO thing will start, you know, loosening that up as well and having more people come forward um, in that field. I, I can't believe I asked um, Seth Shostak. Um, I said, well, what do you think about, you know, astronauts, astronauts that have seen, you know, UFOs? What do you think about that? And he said, that makes absolutely no difference or no better than anyone else. That's that was his, you know, and I totally disagree with that. That's you know I mean? ridiculous. That yeah, um, I I lose all respect for somebody who says something like that. Um, I mean, that's that's a strong statement, but how can you say that? They're so highly trained. They were the best of the best. Yeah. Um, yeah, they didn't get to be an astronaut by accident. You know, I no. mean, they were really. Uh, you know, splendid skills with everything, you know, math, uh, uh, you name it, everything. Oh, yeah. You know, PhDs in engineering and test pilots and fighter pilots. And right. um, how many hours did they spend in the air and, and, and in space? And their lives depend on every single observation they make every second. So to make that statement, that's. Come on, yeah. Seth. <laughs> uh, you know, I. If you it's really, I mean, sometimes I think about this and I, I reflect on it. 1969, we were on the moon. I mean, and you think of what we had for computers, for equipment. Um, you know, I mean, they say a key, a keychain fob had more, you know, computer in it than, you know, <laughs> the space capsule. I mean, it's just amazing that yeah. we were, actually could accomplish that in, in such a short time. 20,000 people were involved in that. Um, and that's something that, you know, these conspiracy theorists that say we never actually landed on the moon, um, you know, but there were 20,000 people working on right, that. Right, right. Yeah, that, that I have no time for those people either. Um, but oh, yeah. I, the I just have to tell you something really funny because I had, I had someone on the show a while back that said, no, you know, we never landed on the moon. And so I told him, I said, well, how about we can actually see the rovers and we can see the you know landing module and everything on the moon now you know there's photographs of them and he said oh they they put them up there afterwards we didn't have the technology then <laughs> <laughs> i love that one that's my favorite you why let facts get in the way of a ridiculous story so yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah go ahead no um so getting back to the uh pentagon ufo um I understand there's at least, you know, now I heard George Knapp early on say that, uh, and I, I wish I could talk to Luis Elizondo himself, but supposedly George Knapp, I think he said there was 10 videos, but there's supposed to be at least one wow. that's going to be coming out soon. I, and, I hope so. That was, that was just amazing. To hear the pilots in their own voice, it's, it's rotating. It's, you know, it just, just remarkable. Um, yeah. so the more, the merrier, keep, keep it coming, you know, in a steady stream and, uh, things will, will have to change. It would look they, what one did. I know it's amazing. I actually, um, you know, I had Stan Friedman on a while back and a couple of weeks ago and he said, this is a whole new ball game. And I totally agree. It, and, he's right. Uh, he's yeah. right. It is. Yeah. But there were a couple of other points, um, 
uh, on that uh, New York Times article that that caught my attention. Um, one of them, when it was talking about uh, Bigelow um, modifying one of his buildings to hold material, supposedly yes. from I don't know if it's I don't know if it it actually specified, but just some sort of material. And I was like, modifying a building. Now, if it was radioactive, just build a radiation lab. But why mm -hmm. would you need to modify a building? Um, Unless it was size. <laughs> possible. Uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, but it, it brought me back to the case I spoke about last time I was on your show about the, um, in Connecticut in 1960, uh, some metallic substances fell near Hartford and New Haven, and they did chemical analysis on it, um, had extremely high levels of barium and, uh, and strontium, which they couldn't understand why it was so high. But the thing was, the substance was losing weight, and it was causing material around it to lose weight as well. Bizarre. Now, that... I can't understand. It said a large amount of material near this metallic substance was losing weight. Now, if this is something extraterrestrial and it causes things to lose weight, lose mass, lose you mass. Kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, you kind of don't want it near all of your lab equipment and <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I I just wanted to bring that up because, of course, this is not the first time they claim to have something. And the fact that they were modifying the building, you know, Cordo sort of put up some red flags for me saying, well, what kind of unique properties does it have that they are, you know, uh, they have to build something or modify something? Um, it could be just a very huge object, or it could be doing something to normal terrestrial material that is highly unusual. Now, I saw, now I don't know if this is related at all, but I saw a real cryptic uh, tweet from Tom DeLong. Someone actually sent it to me mm -hmm. of like uh, material chemical analysis or something. And I thought, wow, does this have anything to do with that? You know, I mean, but even, even so, um, you know, it's probably made up of elements that are all through the universe, whatever it is. Right. But they can certainly tell, like when a meteor, uh, meteorite is examined, they can mm -hmm. tell by the composition and the gases, um, uh, where it's from. And, uh, this may just have things that are highly unusual. I don't know. I haven't gotten any more information on that. Um, I would love to hear about chemical compositions or a little bit more. Do you know, are they planning on releasing any more on the substances? All I know is that uh, Bigelow is not really talking to anyone right now. He may change. I mean, he's got his hands full with the, uh, you know, his space program. Right. But um, but I think he's purposely not talking to anyone right now about any of this. Linda, just one quick second. Would you mind lifting your your mic up a little bit, like just up? I'll tell you when to stop. That? A little further, a little further. Right there is perfect. Okay. 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 All right, that's perfect. So um, yeah, I would really be interested in that. Um, you know what what happens with that? You mentioned there was something, a few things. Is there something else about that article as well? Well, the. The other thing, um, you know, my my special area of interest is the Hudson Valley, particularly the Hudson Valley wave of the 1980s. And I posted something for the 35th anniversary just a couple of weeks ago. And immediately people are saying, well, everyone knows they were secret government craft. Like, you know, what did you have a week, you know, a summer job at Skunk Works? How do you know this? <laughs> and... Um, when Luis Elizondo, I think it was on CNN, said that that the craft that was in the 2004 video, that that is nothing in the U.S. inventory. We don't have things that can do that in the U.S. inventory. And I'm like, well, if we didn't have that in 2004, we sure as heck didn't have that in 1983 and 1984. So I think we have to now reevaluate all previous sightings, if 
it's not U.S. government. How many sightings can you name? I mean, we could spend the rest of the night. How many sightings how, can we name that are explained away as secret government projects? A but lot of the skeptics, that's where they'll, they'll, uh, that's where they'll turn the whole thing. Um, you know, people are saying mm-hmm. um, that it's probably something, you know, most likely military. I mean, I hear that over and over again. But one of the things they don't talk about is what you just said, the early sightings. I mean, they've seen things going 20,000 miles an hour in the late 60s. Right. You know, and that's not going to be something a government had. I mean, mm-hmm. they couldn't hide something that long anyway. And that goes also over and over again for the uh, triangle UFOs. That's what that's what you hear all the time, that mm-hmm. it's some type of military. And it's possible the military has something that we don't know about. But there's a lot of questions that would have to be answered. One, why would something like that fly over a populated area? And someone wrote me a last time I said that. And they said because they want to see the reaction to it. Um, you know, um, so I don't know. I mean, it's all speculation. But I certainly don't think that we had something like that, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Absolutely not. Yeah, so um, I think with the, with his statement and with whatever more information's coming out, we now have to reevaluate the history of, of UFOs. And uh, those skeptics are going to have to go back to their swamp gas theories. <laughs> now, did you watch any of the um, interviews with people like, say, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, on this, did you watch any of those? I interviews? did not. I did not see his. I heard some quotes. Yeah. Um, but uh, he seemed to at least think maybe it was a good idea that we look into this. Although that's that's right. And one thing he did, and I hope that people caught this. Uh, I know Alejandro did. Was that he said, um, "Who's saying it's aliens? And why would you go aliens and all that?" When never there was never one word about aliens in that article. No, there wasn't. There wasn't. And I I saw another article, uh, an interview um, with somebody from Astronomy Magazine in Boston, um, and he's saying, well, you know, we just spent $110 million on this, and, you know, this, and I'm like, no, right off the bat. You're incorrect. It was $22 million over five years, not $22 right. million dollars a year, and completely dismissive. And it's like, no, if you're going to be a skeptic about this and you're going to refute it, at least get your basic facts correct. Um, so, and and who was it? Uh, uh, Michio Kaku said hypersonic drones, possibly. Um, is that correct? I didn't hear that. Yeah, I think he said. I something heard though about, he had a he had a fairly positive attitude about he it. He did. Though. He did, yeah. but he still said, "Who knows? Maybe it's hypersonic drones." I'm like, oh, okay. I, uh, I think I did. I think someone did send that to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hypersonic drones that are enormous tic tacs. Um, yeah. So still, I I don't pretend to know what the what the secret government uh, projects are. But, uh, again, when somebody like Elizondo, who should know because he is assessing aerial threats, he should know what we have in our inventory. And if he said things that can hover, go really fast, no visible means of propulsion or wings, you know, and so on, that we didn't have that in 2004, well, now let's go back and look at every sighting you know, that has a military excuse uh, prior to 2004. And there's a lot of them, as you know. The naval uh, commander, um, David Fravor, he's been Mm -hmm. on a number of interviews. He was just interviewed by the Boston Globe. I think today it came out. Um, But I I love the details he's giving of this, that so-called Tic Tac about it being, you know, a few feet above the water and absolutely no, like, rotor wash or any means of propulsion, nothing, and it just zigging back and forth. Mm. Um, you know, it's really quite amazing that he actually saw that. I'm trying to get him on the show. I have oh, not that heard would back. Be wonderful. I, I did get a connection. We'll see what happens. Yeah, that would be. That would yeah. be great. And uh, it's great that these people are actually talking about it. And one of the things he did say in the Boston Globe article today is people really need to take this seriously. And I, I love that, that, you know, more people mm-hmm. are saying that. 
Yeah, pilots are just wonderful. The details they they come up with. They're my they're some of my favorite witnesses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's another another great witness uh, are pilots, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, I had this conversation the other day that FAA. Uh, just wants to turn their head when it comes to like commercial pilots. They don't want to know anything about what they see. Yeah, great sad. way to kill your career is to yeah. uh, just just state what you saw. And right. that's, again, that is doing a disservice to science and to people who've spent their whole careers, you know, dedicated to flying. Um, if you don't respect them and you don't think they can understand what they're looking at, why are you putting them you know, in the cockpit <laughs> of a multi-million dollar plane with a several hundred passengers. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So. Uh, so, Linda, before we move on to the hunting part of your research, mm -hmm. which I had no idea. I don't know how you and I got in that conversation to begin with. But uh, before we go there, I would love for you to tell your UFO sighting story. I know you did it the last time you were on, but I just love to hear that story. So <laughs> okay, if you would sure. share that with us. Please. Sure. It was uh, December of 1979 and I was in college and um, sitting around in my red furry bathrobe and with my boyfriend and another friend and someone else comes running in and saying there's, there's three lights out there. So we go running outside and it's three whitish yellow lights uh, flying flying along in a kind of a V-shaped formation and me being me, I like, jump in the car, let's go, let's follow them. So we follow them, uh, it's a long story, but eventually we follow them to a uh, state park, uh, Harriman State Park, uh, this Lake Tiarati. And sitting there looking, looking for them, because uh, they had kind of disappeared for a little while. And then all of a sudden, one comes from, I can just picture this, one comes from the east, one comes from the north, one comes from the south. And they're all converging right by this lake where we're sitting in the car. And we're like, oh, my God, they're going to crash. They're, you know, they're going to explode. They come together in a bright flash of light. And then as, as one object, I don't know how this happened, these three objects became one, wow. lower onto the mountaintop, right just a few hundred feet away from us, and there's this pulsating glow at the top of the mountain. At this point, the state trooper shows up. <laughs> and here's a 19-year-old girl in a bathrobe with two guys in a state <laughs> in a car in now, state uh, park. Just to interrupt you real quickly, did he show up? Uh did someone tell him they saw something or do you just happen to be driving have, that way? I have no idea. We oh. were, our sight was fixed on this uh, glowing object and all of a sudden there's a state trooper by our car. You know, what are you people doing? And I said, turn, you know, I tried to explain and not sound too crazy. And I said, turn around and look. And he turned around and the, you know, the mean expression suddenly white as a sheet. <laughs> And he's like, get out of here, get out of here now. And so, you know, when a state trooper's scared, it's like, okay, maybe we, maybe we should get out of here. So we took off. He passed us. He was hauling. He couldn't get out of there fast enough. And I would love if someday um, this story got to him and he got back to me. I'd love to. It, it clearly was something he had seen or experienced before and wanted no part of again. Really? That's how you feel about it? That's how I, because otherwise, if you just turn around and you see a pulsating light, you know, I don't know, should it cause that much fear? He was terrified. He was wow. terrified. So it, it, it seemed that this was not his first uh, run in with something like that. So, oh. yeah, that's uh, that's my story. Red now, bathrobe and all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were there other witnesses that you're aware of or had anyone seen that uh, at a, a different time? You know, uh, did it come back? Um, I don't know if anyone else saw it that night, except uh, my boyfriend remembers it. Um, and he described it in the same, you know, my boyfriend from the time we're still in touch and he described it the same way 
um, lost touch with one of the other people, but uh, I don't know who else had seen it that night. I spoke to someone who worked at the state park, and he doesn't remember that particular night, and he said, oh, I lived in the park. He said, we used to see things all the time. Wow. So, um, real hot spot there. Yeah, yeah. Hot spots have always baffled me how how or why they are hot spots you know i don't know people that's the number one question people say you know why the hudson valley why particular places like pine bush yeah i don't know i don't know if it's something that was here long before we were um something about the geology the water i i just don't know speaking about that phrase something here a long time ago. I just want to say that next week, uh, this is for the listener, next week we have Eric Von Daniken. Um, he's going to be on. But um, you have to realize that the show is going to be a different time. It's going to be at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time because uh, he's in Sweden and I have to accommodate the time for him. So just to let the wow. listener know. Next week, Eric Von Daniken, but at 11 a.m. That should be a fun show. He's He's always a lot of fun to talk. Oh, about. that's amazing. So I'm kind of the warm-up act for Fondonican. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. no. Hey, I'll take it. I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's really, I love to hear first account, uh, first-hand mm-hmm. accounts of, uh, of uh, uh, sightings, and that one's such a unique one. Were they... A lot, now, the thing I've heard is the opposite of that from a number of people that they've seen, well... Charles Halt, for one, that it burst into several lights. A friend of mine saw um, what looked like a square box that burst into five lights and then rotated around. You know, you hear about them coming apart but never mm-hmm. joining as one. That's really bizarre. Yeah, I and I have n- absolutely no explanation for it. I, I don't even know how that's possible. Um, it, right. it didn't look like three blobs stuck together. It looked like one round object it, it had completely changed so Amazing. Um, i'm very fortunate to have have seen that so i guess i was destined from a young age to uh, do what i do <laughs> now is that what actually sparked your interest into looking at all the different things you look at I was always very much into all the strange stories and, you know, the paranormal when I was a kid. It's nothing I thought I was going to do, but how I got into it was um, I was writing about local history for my county's bicentennial in the, in the 1990s, and I was giving a series of lectures and people were asking, started asking about ghost stories, and I was kind of a little miffed i'm like i'm giving a history lecture you know (laughs) but i was like all right i like ghost stories so during one of my history lectures i told one ghost the one ghost story i knew for my county and the next day this librarian calls she goes are you the ghost lady (laughs) like no i hear you give ghost lectures like what did you that I, I told one ghost story she goes could you do a ghost lecture for us oh, so wow. i really you know you get you get you know a few dozen people for a history lecture you get 200 for a ghost lecture it's <laughs> it, it's it's unbelievable and i don't word just spread i honest to god martin i did not lift a finger to do this people started sending me their house keys I hear you're the ghost investigator. We're going on vacation. Can you come investigate my home while we're away? We think we have a ghost. I'm like, what's wow. just happened? I don't. <laughs> so in rapid succession, I became the ghost lady. And um, I now, uh, my first ghost book was 20 years ago already, 1998. Wow. I finally, after doing it for a while, I said, maybe I should come out with a book there's so much interest in this and it was now, a was little this, yeah i'm sorry was it is it your science background the reason that people took you serious right off the bat do you think i i would like to think so um yeah i you know i was a a research scientist for a medical diagnostics company and 
I'm very much into the history and I do my research and I respect people's privacy. You know, I, I've never divulged anybody's identity or location and perhaps they just saw I was going about it the right way in a respectful way and nobody was doing it back then. Um, within, I don't know, eight, ten years everybody was getting a clever acronym and t-shirts and they were suddenly all, you know, ghost hunters and the shows started coming on. Yeah. Um, but I had already established myself a long time ago and they're just, you know, the, the, the who you're going to call, there was nobody to call um, in most ghost places. Busters. Right, ghost <laughs> busters or Linda Zimmerman. Um <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know how many times people have played that song for me enough already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. So yeah. that's how it all, I had no intentions of writing about ghosts. I was just swept into it, and I went with it, and I was absolutely fascinated, and I was I was hooked for day one. Um, the places I've been able to go into, you know, homes and museums and historic sites and and experience things that nobody gets to do. It's, uh, it's nothing I'll ever stop doing, that's for sure. Wow, that's great. And it's funny, we've talked about UFOs many times. I never knew this, this side of you. That's, that's just fascinating. I have many sides. <laughs> In fact, I just last week finished my third zombie novel, so I do that too. <laughs> But yeah, the the UFOs actually came about because every time I'd give a ghost lecture, someone would come up to me afterwards and tell me their UFO story. And I'm like, why are you telling me this? And I'm like, well, you're the person to do this because they liked the way I handled the ghost cases. And uh. they thought I was the one to hear their story and in investigate it. So one just one weird thing there we go <laughs> there's yeah. my territory yeah um one weird thing just led to the other wow wow so let's let's hear about some of the cases now i actually i have actually told my ghost story uh oh, i don't know what it was mm -hmm. so um as a matter of fact i wouldn't i wouldn't call it a ghost but it was something that i actually experienced Yes, no, I heard really? that story, and I'd call it a ghost. You would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you I did hear that. It, That's great. Yes, yeah. I would call it something that was not happy you were cleaning out its house. Yeah. Wow, you do remember that then. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, and, um, you know, it's funny. Just, oh, oh, I don't know, maybe two or three months ago, I was called by um, a, a friend of a relative that asked me to come over to their house uh, their mother had recently passed away and look at the antiques. So I went over there and it was right next door to that house. So I said to them, um, do you know the people next door? Yeah. <laughs> I actually yeah. I actually came out with it eventually while I was there because I ended up feeling comfortable enough and told mm -hmm. them, you know, basically the story. But I still have I still want to go back to the house to see if the uh, if the people are experiencing. Oh, something. I I'd I don't blame you. Did they know who that might have been? Was it a past owner, most likely? Um, you know, they don't know anything about. Um, it was uh, it was a relative of theirs, but they didn't really oh, know anything okay. about the neighbor. Yeah, but still, yeah. It's, it was bizarre. But let's uh, let's hear about your. Let's start out with your first investigation. What was that actually like? My first investigation, I had no idea what I was doing. I had a camera. I had a cassette tape recorder. That's how <laughs> far back I go. And it was the home of a famous local surgeon. She was, uh, she was an international humanitarian, had an AIDS charity to uh, Africa. Um, this beautiful um, mansion built in, the, in a, the style of a Scottish manor home from wow. the uh, 1300s and I'm like what am I doing going to this surgeon's home but they had a ghost story um, they soon after they moved in she had her practice there uh, the maid saw a very tall man uh, long straight silver hair who was looking at her very sternly and then just vanished and they started hearing footsteps doors opening and closing 
and it wasn't threatening. They they gave it a name, and um, yeah, they named the ghost, and they they dealt with it. Then one day, um, some a, a woman, an older woman, comes to the door and says, "You know, my father built this home." So the doctor said, "You know, this may sound strange, but this is what we're seeing. You know, an extremely tall man with long silver hair. She doesn't miss a beat. That's my dad. Ah. He was six foot six." long white hair wow. and he built the home and when he loved it so much when he died he was buried on the property and his tombstone read from this place i shall never roam oh my goodness so <laughs> you can't and this was my first case this was my first case, and I went to the home, and I'll tell you, I'm upstairs in the corridor where they saw them, and I think I was shaking a little, and nothing nothing happened, but, um, you know, it was an amazing, you know, a, a, again, a very high caliber group of witnesses, a famous mm -hmm. surgeon and her staff of nurses, um, so... I was from a very early point in, in my ghost hunting career able to dismiss that belief that it's, you know, people in overalls with a first grade education who see ghosts. That is not the case. Right, right. And um, did you have like a strange feeling when you were in that? Not, not, just, your, not just your fear, but mm -hmm. like, did you have a feeling like, I mean, I think that's what a lot of people talk about. There were a couple of times where I did a quick turnaround because I definitely felt like I was being watched, you know, when you think somebody's right behind you. Um, so that that was it, but it kind of got my spidey senses tingling. Um, and after doing a couple of hundred cases now, now I'll, I'm, I'm not a psychic per se, but when you do something over and over again, now I'll walk into a location. I'm like, okay, you know, this is good. This is bad. You get a, you develop a sense for it. Um, and uh, I, I've learned, I, I said, I've learned a lot. I had no idea what I was doing initially, um, but it worked well, how out. How could you? I mean, you know, you're, you were in <laughs> uncharted waters basically at the time. Yeah, you know, back. I mean, I mean, now, I mean, they're using uh, uh, electronic equipment and things like that. And I don't know how much, you know, that really works. I have some, but I think people get way too into they have to run out and buy thousands of dollars of equipment. One woman did that. And on her first investigation, she realized she was too scared and hated it. And there she stuck with two grand in equipment yeah. um but in a lot of these shows they say well we don't we discount personal experience like what are you crazy no one has ever called me and said oh i woke up in the middle of the night because my emf detector is going on off no you call because you heard footsteps or a door slammed or you saw an apparition um you know so it's very important to to find out what people are experiencing. If you can get something on video or you can have a meter that will detect it, wonderful. But the real haunting is in the personal experience. And I, I decided very early on the best way for me to tell a ghost story is to try to experience that haunted activity, which is why the vast majority of the cases I write about, I've been there. I've been there, done that. Really? So I want to I want to be talking about them, um, and so why don't we why don't we start with uh, some of the cases that you investigated? And when you say you were right there, you were right there when some things happened. Is that what you're saying? Oh, absolutely, yes. Now, do you want to show some of the photos? Yeah, that we have. I uh, sent? He, yeah, he's ready with any of those photos. Sure. So okay. Any story you start talking about, we'll show the well, photos um, for YouTube. If we want to start with the Lizzie Borden door. Lizzie if, Borden. Lizzie Borden. So you actually went to her place in uh, Fall, uh, what is it? Uh, Fall, Fall River. River. Fall yes. River. It, yeah. um, it became a bed and breakfast only in America, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, um, just just for like the young people that don't know the story, there was a they actually had Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. And when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Right. Is that how that goes? Something that's like that? how the poem goes. That is not uh, correct. It's not accurate, uh, though. <laughs> no, her um, her stepmother was hit in the back of the head with an axe 19 times and her, m- her father was hit in the face 11 times with an axe. So these were very personal. This happened on August 4th, 1892 in Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, the Bordens were very wealthy, but Mr. Borden was a bit of a Scrooge. And they lived in a very humble home with no plumbing, no electricity. Um, and wow. guess what? The stepmother was getting uh, the father to... Uh, change his will to make her the main beneficiary and suddenly the two of them end up dead Um, and of course it was kind of scandalous to think a woman could have done something like that so she was put on trial Um, she paid an enormous amount of money for her legal team and she was acquitted and immediately she and her sister bought a huge mansion in the biggest part of town um, but of course she was shunned the rest of her life, but That's what I'd heard. Yeah. yes, but her house, um, went through a series of private owners and they experienced a lot of things, um, full bodied apparitions, uh, doors slamming lights going on and off, you know, all the classic signs. So, um, again, the best way to experience a Lizzie boarding haunting is to go stay in the Lizzie Borden house. So back, uh, I think it was 15 years ago, uh, we went on the anniversary week of the uh, of the crime. And long story short, we show up at t- check-in time. There's no staff. There's a bunch of guests sitting inside waiting, and the staff is missing. Oh. And there's a lot of antiques in this uh house it's there's a bus station right across the street not the best part of town i was like this isn't good so i called the police just to see if they have contact information and when he found out there were guests in the lizzie borden house it was unlocked and the staff was missing all of a sudden there are cops pounding on the front door I open the front door. The cops are running in. Look, they think there's murder, Vic. They think the staff has been murdered. I mean, what are the chances? I'm there on the anniversary week, and cops are running around the house looking for murder victims. Oh, my it's, God. You can't. I was like, I, I hope I can write about this. I hope it was. <laughs> it turned out to be very simple mix-up um, for the first time in the six years of their history of being opened. It was just a staff mix-up. But one of the cops went down into the basement where he swears he heard shuffling footsteps. He followed the footsteps to the back of the basement and there was a body in a coffin. It was a Halloween prop, but it scared the bejesus out of him. He (laughs) came upstairs white as a sheet. So we had all this, this went on for hours. We had all of this excitement. Um, It was finally resolved. We finally got to our room. I was upstairs in, um, it was the maid's room at the time, and if you want to show the picture, it's the the latch is, you're familiar with the old-fashioned latches where the bar the hasp. Uh-huh. goes, okay, yep. um, so before the investigation, I said, I just need to chill for a little while, so I stretched out on the bed, 60 seconds later, I hear hard soul footsteps walking up to my door and stopping. And I'm like, don't, don't mess with the ghost investigator. I'm not in the mood. So I open the door. There's nobody there. I check all the rooms. There's nobody there. I'm like, all right. I know what I heard. I close the door again. Second, I go back to bed. Same thing. Footsteps come right to the door. Only this time I hear clink. And I look as the latch raises out. The bar raises, raises out of the latch. The door swings, starts to swing open. I pull this ninja move. I come leaping out of bed, grab the door, and I yell, this isn't funny. And there's nobody there. There was nobody on the third floor. There was nobody on the second floor. 
So oh, I was like, oh, okay, wow. game on, game on. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, if it were me, I'd, I'd run out. I couldn't, I couldn't handle something like that, but you stayed there. I stayed there the the whole night, and if you, I don't know if you have the photo, but I have a picture of the uh, the actual door door latch, so people yeah, can. Yeah, it was up what, there. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I couldn't see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we had some bizarre sounds. Um, one woman swore she heard a woman crying from the uh, bedroom where uh, Mrs. Borden had been killed. Um, it was just a, it was just a bizarre night. Didn't didn't get much in the way of sleep, but <laughs> it's a fascinating place to go. Not only for the paranormal activity, everybody wants to solve the crime, right? It, um, and I think if you were in the house for five minutes, you realize Lizzie had a hand in it some way. There is no way she and the maid were in this in this house while two people were getting axe murdered over the course of an hour and a half and they didn't hear a thing. No. That was her that was her MO. She did she said she didn't hear anything. She didn't hear a thing. Wow. And that's impossible. It's just that impossible. That sounds like recent politics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing, yes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. No. Uh, every time I say something like that I get bashed. I, I'll take that back. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a wow story. If there's <laughs> So, um, wow, that is a wow, all right. Uh, I had no idea that that mansion was haunted. Never heard anything about it. I actually had a, a hotel ledger that Lizzie signed in uh one time and uh yeah, that was really interesting. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. So, not I don't know if her uh you know, I don't know if she's talked about like she was, you know, years ago. You don't hear her name come up too often. Not, not so much. Um, but it was the trial of the century at the time. It, it absolutely was. And if anybody's interested in criminology, it's something to really look into. And go to the Fall River Historical Society because they have tons of artifacts on the on the murder. They even have the stomach contents. Of of the Bordens, you know, so they knew what they ate that day. They have reproductions of the skulls, which oh, is, no. I mean, this wow. was something very personal. Um, this was not some thief running in and, and you know, committing a murder. This was personal. You don't hit somebody in the face with an axe 11 times. Um, I think once will do it, won't it? Yeah, generally, I would think. <laughs> My goodness. Wow. Yeah, I always thought that was such a bizarre story. Uh, was that the only like murder type case that you looked into, or were there other? Oh other no, ones? I get to all the best murder sites. Um, <laughs> really? <Okay. laughs> there was a case in Hawthorne, New Jersey, where in 1850, a judge and his wife um, were in their home, and someone he had convicted of a crime, who, uh, as he was being t- taken away, said, "I'll get you for this." Um, climbed into the window with, once again, a hatchet and a butcher knife. Oh. And um, he was gunning for the judge, but that night the judge didn't feel well, so he went to bed early, and he took his wife's spot in bed. So when his wife came to bed, she was in his spot. And so he swings the axe down on her. But how would, he know, how would he know which one is the wife's spot, which one... Well, he he was a caretaker um, ah. for yeah. There's a lot more. I'm trying to condense these stories, okay. but yes, that's a good. That is a very good question. He was a caretaker there and knew them, um, and he actually really liked the the wife. But he killed her, then attacked Oops. the judge. The judge starts screaming murder. Um, the servants run in. The guy takes off. He was he was convicted. Uh, he was caught and convicted and and hung. Um, but how long ago was this? 1850. Oh wow! Uh-huh. But they tried to rent out the house. But um, in 1880s, the New York Times. We're back to the New York Times. Had a well-researched article, and the New York Times said no one would rent the house because it was known to be the abode of unearthly visitants. 
I mm. love that phrase, the abode of unearthly visitants. That's the New York way, <laughs> uh, Times way of saying it had ghosts. Wow. So I've somebody, never heard that saying before. Isn't That's that great. great? Yeah. So they open up the house. Guess what? They find out the crime scene was never cleaned up. If you want to rent a house, you might want to clean up a double axe murder. So they finally cleaned it all up 30 some odd years later and uh, it became a private home again. And people kept hearing all kinds of noises. Um, I got in on it because the current owner would suddenly wake up in this panic and he, this happened a couple of times during the years he was there. He realized, he found out, it was on the anniversary of the murder night Jeez. that he, this would happen to him. So, me and my friend Mike Warden, who's an actual cop, um, went to investigate the anniversary of the murder several years ago. So, we're standing in the hatchet room, uh, murder room. And it's about the time of the murders, and I swear to God, we suddenly hear this sound like a wheezing sound. And I said, "What?" We're like, "What is that?" And it evolved into all I can describe it as. If you've ever heard somebody with fluid in their lungs, and just a wheezing, long exhale, and then silence. It was like it was the death breath. It was the death breath. And here me and this cop were just absolutely paralyzed. We could not move. Um, got it on tape to the point where you hear something wheezing, but not as clear as we actually heard it. Hmm. So those axe murders, boy, there. <laughs> now, when you say you have it on tape, um, did you, it was like, so the second time you, is when you, thought to turn on the recorder is that no i always have a recorder on when i'm at a location so uh -huh. i had it on and you can hear us saying did you hear what is that and then you hear something like <gasps> uh, mm. we heard it a lot more clearly but there is definitely something on tape um, I would love to have like a professional take my tapes and, and clean them up and, you know, amplify them. Um, if you can still do that with old digit, you know, with old cassette tapes and things. Um, now, one question I have for you, because this came up in uh, one of the people that, with one of the people I interviewed. How about cases where it's actually the person that's being like followed? Do you have any cases like that? Yes. Um, many people, they said, I don't understand it. Every single place I live seems to be haunted. And I remember very early on, someone told me um, a ghost can attach to a person, a place, or a thing. And I've heard a lot of haunted antique, antique stories. In fact, I give a lecture on haunted antiques. Um, and people who seem to be very sensitive. I have a friend, uh, Barbara, who's a psychic, and she said, people who are sensitive are like a lighthouse in the darkness to spirits. And I thought, that's a great, that's a huh. great analogy. And for some reason, things can just attach themselves to people. Um, there was a case where one woman, I, I think she kind of brought it on herself. Um, her family was part of the Irish Republican Army, and she felt a lot of guilt from their bombings, I guess, and she felt that the spirits were following her because everywhere she went, there were these very nasty negative hauntings. Um, and it wasn't just her imagination, family members, friends, you know, were all able to confirm it. So... I, you know, I don't know what you do. Go see your clergyman, um, do whatever. But yes, there are cases where um, something just keeps following a person or multiple things follow them. Well, I know we got a number of other stories to tell. I mean, I'm really, I'm really having a good time. But oh, I'd good. like to, I'd like to offer people if they'd like to call in um, to the show and ask you a question, 
If that's all right with you, I oh, will give that I'd number. Oh, I'd love to. Out. Sure, sure. Please. Okay, and this is the live number only. And uh, the reason I have to say that is because when this show plays on the Dark Matter Digital Network, I get calls <laughs> during while it's playing. <laughs> so um, okay. actually, we have a big audience on that show um, on Thursday. So if you'd like to call in, that number is 603 967 4030. And if you're calling from another country, just put a one in front of that. 603 967 4030. If you have a, a question for our guests this evening. So um, well, let's talk about some other uh, cases that you would like to talk about that you found very interesting. Sure. One of my scariest, I sent you the uh, the two Pomona pictures. There's a photo of a living room and then there's a photo of something in the dark. Um, this was a case where a woman contacted me. They were renting a house. It was a 1960s modern style house. Didn't look particularly spooky, but uh, they were hearing pounding footsteps objects would come off of shelves and smash, I mean, real like poltergeist type of activity. And the worst part, they would wake up in the middle of the night and something, some dark solid figure would be leaning over, looking down at them. So that was it. They were moving as soon as they could. They were packing to go and they said, we're leaving in, you know, a couple of weeks if you want to come by. I think uh, next night I was, I was there And that's one of those places you walk in the door and you're like, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? I mean, just felt really negative, um, very intimidating. And we would be upstairs and we'd hear pounding downstairs. We'd go downstairs and it would be pounding upstairs. It just seemed to like to play games with you. And it was the end of the night and I'm packing up my gear. And I suddenly, I'm in the, this living room in the dark, and there's a very faint light coming through the curtain, and I see something moving from right to left. So I say to the uh, woman who was renting it, who was behind me, I said, you know, you have a street light, maybe a truck just went by. She goes, no, we're over 100 feet from the road. There is no street light. She said the only way for something to block that light, which was on the side of the house, is if it was in the room with you. Uh. Like, oh, great. So I grabbed my infrared camera and started taking pictures. And I couldn't see, you know, you can't see anything in the dark on those little screens. So it wasn't till I got home and put it on my computer that I see that dark figure um, in that photo I sent you. I don't know if you have that up. Uh, I, he's switching through a different, a couple of different photos, but... Um, so you, there was an actually dark figure in that room. You actually saw that and took a picture. I saw it. Here it is. Uh, Linda, we have a call coming in. Are you ready okay. for a call? Sure. Okay. And we'll get back to that. Uh, hang on just a second. Okay. Caller, you are on the line. Uh, please uh, give your first name and where are you calling from? Yes, hi. This is uh, Philip Gillenwater calling from Redondo Beach, California. Hi, Philip. Uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I just had a, a quick a quick question regarding um, something that Whitley Strieber has mentioned a few times, and I wanted to get Linda's take on it. With the um, he's he's claiming there's a, a correlation between uh, paranormal activity and what he has termed the visitors or ETs, and I just wanted to see if she could comment on that. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, People were initially saying, well, it's all related, and uh, and to be honest, when I first started researching UFOs, I didn't see a relation. Now I do. I don't know what that is, but places like Pine Bush, which have intense UFO activity for decades, is also intensely haunted, and the same people who are experiencing the haunting, living in a haunting ha- haunted house, are also experiencing the, the contact uh, the, or just sightings. And I've found this time and time again that I, I don't know what it is, but this, the two types of activity happening in the same locations to the same people. So um, I agree with with Whitley Strieber, um, but I don't have an answer. 
Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thanks. Thanks for calling in, Phil. All right. So, yeah, interesting. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, Paul Eno's take. Um, he's been on the show a couple of times. Um, you know, he thinks everything is connected like that as well. And, but he's thinking it's more like um, uh, what are they called brains, you know, like membranes, uh, the ultra, uh, uh, ultra dimensional, hmm. interdimensional. Like some type of connection there. I, I, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the veil of normalcy is very thin in these locations, for sure. <laughs> well put. Um, <laughs> did you have more to continue on about that story? You were, you were... Well, no. Um, just that that photo of that dark figure is uh, certainly one that I I could not explain. And as I said, I saw it um myself and to be able to capture it on on film like that that was that was just a bad bad haunting and the turns out we did did some research into the man who owned the place and uh let's just say he used to like to experiment on women and oh. i uh i always say death does not improve one's personality <laughs> And um, he is still trying to victimize particularly women there. Now, this figure that the picture's up there now on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, this figure you saw, did it actually move or did it just stay stationary? What I saw, I didn't see it as a figure. I just saw something solid blocking the light coming through oh, those curtains. I saw it move about. the mm -hmm. length of the curtains and go off to the left there. And at that point, you know, I got my camera and started uh, taking photos. So I didn't see it as that kind of hunched over figure. I I probably would have run um, <laughs> if I knew uh, if I knew what I was in the room with there. So uh, that's probably my best photo in in 20 years of, of doing this because it's, it's nothing, you know, a lot of the times maybe it's a reflection or maybe it's this or some anomaly with the lens. There's nothing I know that I can explain that figure. Wow. And uh, the other picture I had showed was what the living room looks like. So there's not a coat rack there or, a, you know, a hanging plant or, or anything like that. And uh, let's talk about, some other um, things that you've actually witnessed similar. Have you ever actually ever had a poltergeist type of situation that you witnessed? That I personally witnessed, I have never seen anything flying across the room or, or anything. A door slamming, banging for sure. Um, there was a case at... Um, Actually, Mike's grandmother's house that has an, an that's how he got interested in in ghosts because his grandparents' house was was haunted. And I was I was upstairs and it was one of these older homes with heavy plaster walls. And I thought I heard some knocking in the wall. So I put my hand on the wall and I, you know, am I feeling something? So I knock really loud on, you know, it's hard to knock on pla hard walls like that. I knock three times, put my hand on it. Something knocks three times right under my hand. I heard it. I felt the reverberation under my hand. And I, I was startled. I jumped back like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, I have to try this again. So I stepped forward and this time I knocked twice and it knocked twice back. So when you get personal response like that, that just brings your ghost investigation to an entirely different level. It's one thing to see, you know, a light flicker or something like that. But when you're getting a response um that's just amazing it's breathtaking yeah that would be that'd be another time that i'd vacate the place immediately <laughs> um and i i don't i don't i i don't know how people stay in a house when there's something going on you know i just couldn't do that i don't care how wonderful i thought the house was you know i'd, I'd have to go 
<laughs> yeah, well, if you knew Mike's grandmother, she's uh, she's a 90-year-old fireball, and she just yells at them, you know, shut up, I'm trying to get to sleep, and uh, <laughs> so nothing's driving this this woman out of her home, for sure. She's wonderful. <laughs> wow. wow, amazing. And uh, uh, what about some other cases? Why don't you go into, and I know you sent us some pictures. Mm -hmm. So why don't you go into some of the other cases that you've investigated? Okay. Well, uh, there's a few of the Patchett house that I, I sent you. There's one with me sitting on the floor looking like I have alien eyes there. That's a picture <laughs> of me in infrared. This was a house that was started as an inn in 1827 in Montgomery, New York. It was a private home. It was a funeral home for a while. Um, it was uh, a number of different things, and it's now an art school. And um, they see a woman walking around. In fact, when the when the house was boarded up and vacant, one of the Patchett descendants, who's a real brain surgeon, was driving by, and he saw his aunt Emma in the window waving at him. She had been dead for decades. Um, but that's the type of thing they see, you know, nothing terribly threatening, but then there can be some threatening things. You never know when you dig deep enough. So, um, we went there to investigate, um, Mike, my friend, Barbara, the psychic and I, and, um, sitting on the floor with my EMF meter, which is an electromagnetic field meter. And we're hearing these noises coming down from the basement. And when Mike took this picture of me, you can see my EMF meters all lit up because something was going on. And shortly after that, we heard the loudest sound I've ever heard on an investigation. We were on the second floor and it sounded like someone on the first floor picked up a couch and threw it across the room. It was unbelievable. I mean, we just all gasped and I jump up and, and go to run downstairs and Mike stops me and he's got his hand on his gun because he thinks somebody actually broke in. He says, nope, let me go first. And I'm like, yes, let's oh, this let is a the police cop. officer. Yes. yes. Let's uh -huh. let, it's a very good having a cop on a police, <laughs> on a, a ghost investigation. So he goes down, we check every door and window is locked. Um, not a thing is out of place. We don't find anything on the floor. Nothing has been touched. So at the time of this incredible banging sound, Mike had a trail camera set up in the basement next to the old embalming sinks. And when he later went over the footage, he found that, are you familiar with the trail cameras? Something has to pass in front of it to yes. set it off, and it takes a series of photos. Mm -hmm. Well, something about that time set off the camera, and then it grabbed the camera. I have a series of a couple of photos. Something black grabbed the camera and shook it. And we tested what happens if you put your hand on a camera. Well, your fingers look bright white. You can see the fingerprints. Um, most things look very, very white in infrared. Whatever this was did not reflect infrared. It was solid black. It wasn't a moth or something. It was something strong enough to shake this big camera on a tripod. It, what and about black gloves? With that still we tried shirt? that. We tried you that did? as well. Mm -hmm. um, black leather gloves, black cloth gloves, um, black clothing tends to, uh, most clothing reflects very brightly um, in infrared. We could, and even if it was, we could reproduce it with black gloves, the house was locked up tight and we were the only people in the house. Mm -hmm. So something in the basement next to the embalming sinks was grabbing the camera as that enormous pounding sound was reverberating through the house. So when you're in an old funeral home and these things are happening, wow. <laughs> I'll say it, wow. <laughs> now, in this particular situation, did were the people calling you about this? or It looks like an old abandoned place. Is it, is it just the downstairs that... Well, it's a, it's a um, it's an art gallery in a, in an art school, so it's not set up like a home. So most of the rooms are open space, so they can set up easels and and things like that. Um, but yes, they had called 
they had called us and we'd done several subsequent investigations there. But it seemed that every time we'd investigate the next day, bad things would happen. Um, the electrical system would break down, pipes would burst. Um, and they, th the woman, she's a sweet woman, she finally said, no more. I can't, I can't have you here anymore because it's upsetting what, whatever is here. So we kind of stirred things up, not intentionally, but, you know, I, I can't blame her for not wanting to be back. Yeah, absolutely. Now, did she happen to keep in touch with you after that and say that things calmed down? I haven't, I have not heard since the last time I was there. So I'm hoping no news is good news. And things would be fairly calm unless someone was particularly looking for that activity. Um, but it was just bizarre things like uh, soon after they opened, uh, she's teaching a class and there's a phone ringing, the old style phone that actually had a real bell. Uh -huh. And one of the students finally said, are you going to please answer that phone? And she responded, I would if we could find it. There was no phone in the house that had a real bell. They could never find where this phone was that mm. was ringing. So just just remarkable things like that there. Great. Now, uh, in the title of the show, I know you mentioned graveyards and asylums. So um, you want to tackle one of those? <laughs> yes. Um, probably my worst personal experience was at uh, Rolling Hills Asylum, which is in Bethany, New York, kind of it's Western New York towards Rochester area. And it was a uh, tuberculosis asylum, uh, the criminally insane, unwed mothers, poor people. Basically, everybody, you know, was just jammed into this massive building, 65,000 square feet of, of hell. So um, Mike and I uh, went up there to investigate a couple of times. And, you know, there's the electroshock room and there's the morgue and there's the detention rooms and the majority of the rooms had chains still on the walls from when they used to chain up the unruly uh, people. I mean, just you can just imagine, you know, you had sex offenders in there with orphans. I mean, the horrors that had to have gone on in this place. So we were hearing a lot of noises and strange things. And, you know, you're, I was on alert, but I wasn't, I wasn't scared. And we went into the second floor east wing. And I was with Mike and his brother, Scott. And we're, we're walking down this corridor. And I didn't realize I had, it's, you know, pitch black. I had gotten about 10 or 15 feet ahead of them. So I was alone out in front. And it was nothing I saw, but it was the worst feeling of my life. It felt like a male presence rushed out of this room and just, it was a violating feeling. I just felt I was being attacked because I was a woman. And it, again, it took my breath away. Um, I got, I had to get out of there and it just, it just felt awful. And actually felt like more than one man. I just had to get out of there. And thank God, as soon as I got through the, the big heavy metal doors, the feeling stopped. And I even said out loud, they can't get me out here. So the owner of the property, I saw her later on that night and I didn't, I didn't want to say, you never say, do people experience, you know, ABC. I just said, what do people experience in the second floor East Wing? And she rolled her eyes. She said, oh, that place. She said, there are two very angry male spirits who hate women. And women are always having problems there. Crazy. And so we left that night and... For months, that was bothering me because that was the one and only time something got to me and it got to me bad. And I had to go back. So months later, we 
drive the seven hours back up there. I go walking into that second floor east and I said, I'm back and I know all about you and you're not pulling that again. And I, it didn't happen to me again. And, I, and on a personal level, I felt so much better. I was not letting these sons of, you know, get away with this stuff. Did um, you do hashtag me too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no hashtags back then yet. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Wow. So that that is a, that's a crazy experience. Yeah. Uh, and so and so after you went back you felt better it sounds like. I absolutely did. I I felt uh I, I just couldn't let them get away with that. And uh you know, I had to let you know it sounds crazy but I had to let them know that I was not one of their victims, and that was important to me. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, so I hope people who you can you can go there and do ghost hunts all the time now. I just hope they they kind of forewarn people, especially women. You know, it, it's a good point that you know everybody thinks, oh, this is a great, it's a party atmosphere. We're going on a group ghost hunt, and I see they're even having costume night. Uh, everybody dress up in a wacky costume and go on a ghost hunt this is serious stuff and these are the if you believe in this these are the spirits of very disturbed people sometimes and there's consequences to doing this you don't i don't come home and get a good night's sleep a lot of times from this um it can affect especially you're dealing with so many cases of suicides and tragedies and things involving children and you can't have you can't have a heart and do this and and be callous about it. It it gets to you. So um, yeah, some of these cases it takes days to recover. I I can understand that. How, why do you think things linger in a certain like I, I've heard that like a building is torn down, a new building built, and it, there's still something there. How how does that? How can an energy linger in a place like that? <sighs> I have a perfect example of that. Um, I think people are hooked by a tragedy, some something unfulfilled, some regret. Um, there was a, have you heard of t- Contadina tomato sauce? Uh-huh. Um, the Contadina factory started in the Hudson Valley, and there was a boiler explosion in the early 1900s, and the owner was horribly scalded and killed. And the, the factory was abandoned, but for years, people saw his figure walking around the factory. Well, I went and investigated, actually, with a cop um, who brought me there, and um, we investigated the, the empty, you know, shambles of a building. Well, several years later, I heard they demolished the factory and built a couple of new homes on it. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? I wonder if it will inherit anything. And one night, I get a call, and this woman says, you know, I don't understand. We have a brand new home, and we're seeing this man walking around our house. And she told me the town they were in and the general area, and I said, was your house built on a former tomato sauce factory? She says, you're amazing. You're so psychic. How How did you ever know? And I said, no, I'm not psychic. I said, I was there investigating you know, your, your property when it was still the tomato sauce factory. And so I told her what, what, you know, had happened. And so I said, you're not going to move, are you? She says, well, now I understand it. She, she, so she was, you know, she knew he wasn't anything threatening. Um, and it was just a tragic death. And, you know, when you're killed yeah. like that in an instant, like the judge's wife one minute she's sound asleep, the next an axe is falling into her face. She She's the one who's haunting the place because she had no idea what happened. And psychics have since been to the house and they'll say there's a confused woman here. She doesn't know what happened to her. Um, so I think that's part of the reason people remain. They're trying to figure out, you know, what just happened. We had a question come into the chat room quite a while ago, actually. Someone wanted to know, had you ever looked into the Amityville case? I know that was not really that far away from you, was it? No, it wasn't terribly far. um, But no, I did not have any personal experience with that case. Um, We had our own 
very popular case in Nyack, New York, where a, f- a couple went to buy a house. They put a down payment on, and then the owner told them it was haunted, and they tried to back out of the deal, and it went all the way to the New York State Supreme Court, who, as a matter of law, found the house haunted. That was the first legal haunting, and that sent repercussions around the world because could anybody back out of a deal now because they thought a place was haunted? So uh, you might know for your area, uh, do realtors have to disclose? There you yes. go. And yes. that's because- uh, I have a friend in the real estate business, and he, he told me, um, uh, I can't remember exactly the situation, but he said that he had to pass on it. Uh, no, he had to disclose that there was a, a haunting in a place. And that is all the result of that NIAC case um, that I did look into. I've spoken to several. Uh, some owners, no problem. Other owners, they did not stay long because so much was, was happening there. But yes, that's, that's the case that uh, set all of these new laws in motion. I want to tell a quick story. I don't know if I had told this before. I don't think I did, but m- the same friend. Um, I I was doing work at a house which was uh, helping this 92, 92-year-old lady sell her fine antique. She had some beautiful things. So I would help her sell. She'd invite me over for a piece of pie. That was so fun. And then she'd say, take this and take that. And so I'd sell these things for her. So she passed away. The son came and... There was a a situation, she said over and over, she had a special desk. It was a Chippendale desk. And she said, Mm -hmm. this is my son. It's going to my son. You know, it's a family thing. It belonged to a governor in our family and blah, blah, blah. I had it made in the 1700s. So I'm there and the son is arrogant as can be. And he Mm -hmm. says, I don't want anything. Sell it all. So I said, your mother really said many, many times she'd want you to have this desk. Just this desk, you know, and Mm -hmm. goes, get rid of it. I don't want it. Well, uh, my friend sold the property, the real estate, and he sold it to a contractor. The contractor put a ton of money into it, and then he called my friend up, and he said, did you know this place is haunted? <laughs> and uh, what would happen is the attic, they'd hear things dragging in the attic, and everything would get piled and stacked on top of each other. Wow. And it happened over and over again, and they, they said, that's it. we are getting out of here. They sold the place after he restored it completely. Oh, so, <laughs> I think it was amazing. the woman being angry that her son didn't take the desk. I think so. <laughs> I definitely think so. Yeah, I um, I don't know how angry this woman was, but I think it was certainly cause for the haunting. Uh, family moved into a house and uh, the little boy kept seeing what he called regular grandma to distinguish from his other grandparents. Regular grandma sitting on this particular spot on the steps described her to a T. Um, they got a collection of photographs of previous owners and r- immediately he picked out, that's her, that's regular grandma. And that was the woman who had just previously died in the house before they bought it. You know, he wasn't even alive then. He was just a, a few years old. They, they're, So the her sons are wondering, why is she still at this house? And I went to investigate and, you know, we we're talking about telling the story. Well, one of the sons realizes that she was cremated and it was her wish to have her as- ashes scattered in this particular location. The urn was still in his closet. He had mm. for- They had forgotten to wow. <laughs> spread her ashes. And so they finally went. And followed her wishes, spread her ashes, and she hasn't been seen since. Oh. So don't. She is a regular grandmother now. Yeah, so. she's a regular yeah. grand. <laughs> so don't yeah. aggravate those old ladies. Um, <laughs> they will haunt you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So graveyards. Have you actually? What did you do in a graveyard? What did I do? Well, that's a personal question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, and the, the ghost investigating, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, I've been in a lot of cemeteries. I think the most um, dramatic story I know, I did not personally in, uh, witness, but it was one of the best witnesses I'd ever interviewed. He was the caretaker. Um, he was also a, a chaplain. 
um, you know, very religious. And one day he was a uh, bright, sunny spring day. He's walking his two dogs. They were uh, black labs, you know, which are very friendly dogs. Mm -hmm. And as he's walking along the cemetery back towards the house, he sees a young woman in her 20s, uh, long brown hair, glasses, uh, jeans. Uh, he sees her in the far end of the cemetery walking towards the exit. But instead of turning uh, to, to go out the exit, she turns and starts coming straight for him. And she just had this completely blank expression, and he thought, wow, she just visited a grave or something. She's so distraught, she doesn't realize she just missed the exit. The dogs see her, because they're pulling towards her, wagging their tails. He sees her coming right towards her. She doesn't even, she pays no attention to him and his dogs. And he said, actually, he was upset. How can you not pay attention to my dogs? Um, he, You know, dog lovers. And she passed him maybe five or six feet. They, they passed. And he said, I have to say something. He immediately turned around and she was gone. She was absolutely nowhere to be. There was nowhere for her to go. And he could describe her exactly. So when he's telling me this story about a year later, you can still see it in his eyes. That's why you need to be on these locations and, uh, you know, uh, interview these people, these eyewitnesses personally, you could just see it in his face, how this had affected him. Mm. And I said, was it something about the day? And he's like, no, 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 it was it. Something? Finally, I said, wait a minute. What about the area of the cemetery where you first saw her walking? And he got, he got all white over again. He goes, I, I never thought of that. Two days before that, sighting he attended a funeral of a young woman in her 20s who had been killed tragically and he said it was the most painful funeral he had ever attended and that was the description of the woman he saw walking away from that location two days later um just and so much happens in this cemetery two past caretakers have committed suicide uh, one in, and I'm like, you took this job. Why? Um, you know, that's not a good track record, but a lot it's called Oak Hill cemetery. It's also in Nyack. Nyack is a very haunted town right on the Hudson river. Um, but, uh, if you're in the area or looking for a good haunt, that is one cemetery to go to for sure. Now, have you actually stayed in that cemetery for a few hours or anything like that? Yes, yes, I, I have. Um, you know, a lot of these places you're not allowed to be in after dark for very mm -hmm. long, so I, I have no intention of getting arrested. But, yeah, um, I, didn't, I did not experience anything creepy in that cemetery. Um, there have been, there's a cemetery... Uh, up in Port Jervis, New York, that uh, Laurel Grove, where we did experience some very frightening, frightening things. Um, people see full-bodied apparitions floating by. We saw strange lights that we can't explain, um, felt things. I mean, actually, it actually felt like fingers running along your arm. Um, very, very disconcerting things, but this cemetery, it's, um, it's at the confluence of a couple of rivers and one year when the Delaware flooded, it washed away all the bodies on the side of the hill and bodies were being retrieved as far down as Philadelphia. Wow. So if Jeez. disturbing the dead causes a haunting, um, that's certainly a good reason for it. Um, interesting. So, as far as um, other places that you've seen, you you mentioned to us what the scariest one. Um, can you? Does anything come to mind that you'd say like that is the most unexplainable events that happen in this in this house or place? Yes, my favorite case was. Um it was a big mansion, which is now called the Columns Museum, which is in Milford, Pennsylvania. And um, it's, it's a county historical museum now. 
And it was one of these cases where Mike and I got the keys and the security code. And it was like, yeah, go in and go in and investigate. And this museum, and these are serious artifacts in here. Like when uh, Lincoln was shot in Ford Theater, the flag that was, that was draped over his box, they pulled that up and bunched it up under his head. And that's the flag they have hanging there with Lincoln's bloodstains from the night he was assassinated. I mean, amazing artifacts. But Mike and I walk in. I am not five feet in the door. And I just I just see this this woman with upswept hair and a dress with puffy sleeves. And she's just so loud and strong. And I said to Mike, I said, well, that was not quite a paranormal cream pie in the face, but she was the absolute most intense thing I have ever encountered. Um, later on were you know, those old hair curling machines that look kind of like torture devices. They had the, the electrodes hanging down for women to get permanence in the twenties. <laughs> right. You've probably yeah. seen them. I have well, seen them. Yeah. I'm standing looking at one of these and I said, look at that hair curling machine. And with that, a finger goes back under the, my baseball cap and goes like this through my hair as I'm talking. And I was like, and at that moment I just felt she read me like a book so i kept i kept talking about this woman all night i could picture her i knew where she was standing um and i said she know i kept saying to mike i said i know this sounds nuts she knows who i am she she just read me she knows who i am well long story short towards the end of the night i hear the swishing of old skirts and i go chasing after the skirts and it leads me to an office in the back and I'm like what am I supposed to find here and Mike says well what about those there's all these file cabinets so there's take me 10 years to go through these I said well let me see there's something she wants me to find here I open one of the drawers I pull out a folder I'm thumbing through it and there's an article about Linda Zimmerman the ghost investigator (gasps) <gasps> the one article in 10,000 pieces of paper, I follow the sounds of her going there because I know she wants me to find something. I find an article about myself. Uh, it's like, how do you odds of that? How do you make that up? And so when I described what we experienced to the to the curator, she says, I know who that is. That's uh, Madame Pierce. It was um, a local woman who, um, when she died, when all of her belongings were brought to the museum, and she came along. That's one of those cases where haunted objects, she came along with it. And many people since then have described the same woman in the same location. And I, ha- I got a photograph of her, upswept hair, puffy sleeves. She was the strongest, clearest, most conscious ghost I have ever encountered and probably ever hoped to encounter. Fortunately, she was very nice. Uh-huh. But um, again, I, if I wrote that as fiction, people would say, oh, come on. Um but but to have that happen, you, that to me was the most, I don't believe this just happened, case yeah, I've ever had. That is something. We have about six minutes left. Um, a couple of questions. First of all, do you think that fear, like the person like you experiences, experiencing these things, do you think fear has any level of control at all or they have control over you? And then I want to ask you one more question after that before we wrap it up. Yes, absolutely. Um, fear just invites them to take advantage of you. Um, and I've seen some cases where people are so terrified in their own homes, they pull the curtain closed, they don't go anywhere, they don't do anything. And the the whole haunting takes over their lives. There was one case where I said, yeah, I think you have a ghost, but open these curtains, put on your favorite music, get out of the house, don't feed into this thing. So um, things were great after that. So oh. um, it, it doesn't always work, but don't don't give in to it. You're, you've got the advantage. You're alive. It's your place. Tell them to get out. <laughs> Seriously. 
So um, this isn't the question that I wanted to ask you, but so basically there's been a few times that you've been able to actually help people, it sounds like. What I found to be remarkable and extremely gratifying is after doing this a couple of years, people would call me up and say, what did you do when you were here? And I'm like, well, what, you know, is something missing? You know, is the silver missing? What, what are you talking about? She said, no, since you were here and told the story, you know, investigated, did the research, told the story, the activity stopped. And I find in 30 to 40% of the cases, that's how I don't perform rituals or exorcisms or clearings. I go and find out their story. I tell their stories. And if the haunting is the result that something is unresolved and they want the world to know why they're there, maybe just telling their story is, is enough. That's Amazing. So one of the last question I have for you, we only have oh, about three or four minutes left here, and that is objects. You mentioned antiques or objects that are haunted. I would love to hear an example of that. Um, family bought an antique bed and put it in the spare room and kept hearing a little boy coughing and coughing, and they'd go in the room and it would stop, and they swear they were... They finally went back to the antique dealer and said, okay, What's the story with this? First of all, you're taking it back. So now tell us the story. A little boy died of pneumonia in that bed. <sighs> so um, you have to be very careful what you bring in the house. A simple thing, a uh, family bought uh, an old fedora, put it on a side table, walked by the room, and there was an old man sitting wearing the fedora. Um, they got rid of the fedora. Um, <laughs> some great stories involving haunted objects. I've been in the fine arts and antiques business all my life. I've never actually heard a story, but I brought a couple of things home that um, the person I was with said, please get rid of that. I have a bad feeling, you know, so and, I, I can understand that. Yeah, you, you have to honor that. Um the, you know, it's not a good idea to bring home things from murder sites and crime sites. And it just isn't. Uh, I had a case where a woman brought home a pair of cemetery gates and installed them in front of her house. Yeah. <laughs> How did that work out for her? <laughs> wow. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I've always had a really good time talking to you. Can you also just, uh, you have a website or is it just... Uh, yeah, I have a lot of Facebook pages, um, mm -hmm. but I have a website, go to zim.com. That's right. Yep. Um, most of my books are uh, in ebook format, but uh, all my ghost books are in print uh, from Amazon. Most of the stories I told are in um, my 10th anniversary collection of books. I have, I think, 15 of them at this point. Um, so if you like in depth uh haunted investigation cases. That's what I do. Wow. Excellent. Thanks so much, Linda. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Yes. And I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. So that's it for the show. Thank you so much uh, for listening and, or thank you for supporting the show. If that's what you are or watching it on YouTube or uh, the dark matter digital network, if you'd like to support the show, all you have to do is go to podcastufo.com and all that information is there. I want to thank a few people. First of all, our guest, Linda Zimmerman. I um, also want to thank uh, Alejandro Rojas for the doing the UFO updates, as well as Evan, who's a new producer. I want to thank him and Peggy for managing the Facebook page. Again, next week, we'll be back with Eric Von Daniken, and that's at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I don't have the GMT time up in front of me right now, but I'm sure there will be a lot of people in Europe uh, listening live that will be on YouTube as well. All right, everyone, so thanks so much, and remember to keep your eyes to the sky.